Hey everyone, how's it going today? I'm Daniel Snyder, host here at Seeking Alpha, and we have Austin joining us today. Austin, how's it going? I'm good, man. What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining us. If you don't know, my name is Austin Hankwitz. I create short form videos on TikTok and Instagram about personal finance and investing. And I also write these long analyses to my uh, Substack community, which you should soon see on Seeking Alpha. So really excited about that. But hanging out here with Daniel, we got a bunch of stuff to talk about with earnings, with Tesla earnings, right? We got a bunch of stuff. We got a really cool guest named Michael Boyd joining us. So Daniel, walk us through the agenda. Let's let's start walking into these things. Yeah, let's get into it. So, uh, well, actually, I mean, we have people tuning in right now. I just want to encourage everybody as we're going, you know, I want to interact with you guys. So, um, you know, if you have questions as we're talking about what's going on in the stock market, going over earnings, going over the different topics we're going to talk on today. If you have any questions, leave them down in the chat box. We really want to hear from you guys, interact with you guys in real time and try to help you out if you have any questions. So without further ado, though, we got to go back. Last week, we were talking about Tesla earnings and what we were watching in regards to Tesla. I know what I was watching. So let me just go ahead and share a little bit of that. Um, Josh, why don't you go ahead and throw up that first slide for me there about the uh, the screenshots from Tesla. And I'll just go over these real quick. So Tesla, we were talking about last week, keeping an eye on commodity prices, how margins will be affected, et cetera. And you kind of saw that, I think, in the margin compression that we saw here. Margins compressed for the quarter to 27.9%, probably because of higher commodity costs. But, you know, commodities will come down. And I think they, you know, what company does automation better than Tesla, right? And they don't spend any money on marketing. They have so, such an advantage here. Um, but the thing that surprised me, which I, I now look back and I'm like, man, Austin, I should not have been surprised, is they <laughs> sold their Bitcoin, hold, well, 75% of their Bitcoin holdings, right? Did, did you expect this or was I the only one? I was not expecting this, but I really commend them for doing so for a profit, right? I don't know about you guys, but I'm down on my Bitcoin. I feel like everyone's kind of down on their Bitcoin right now, but I feel like they saw some weird like timing. They said, you know what, we're up right now. And, and I think too, I don't know if you guys read through their uh, earnings call, but Elon Musk made sure to tell everyone, you know, they sold their Bitcoin for liquidity purposes, right? They want to make sure that they had cash in the bank in case whatever's going on with COVID, whatever was going on with COVID in China and Shanghai, right? That also ate into their margin. Um, you know, that was that was some of their margin compression as well, right? Shanghai factories uh, was shut down and the ramping costs of their Austin and Berlin factories, those negatively impacted the margins. But, you know, Elon's like, hey, guys, we still got our Dogecoin, nothing to worry about here, but we sold our Bitcoin because of liquidity. We want to make sure we had cash in the bank in case maybe, you know, prolonged shutdowns over in China. I want to make sure that we were, you know, ready for that. So something else that caught my eye, I don't know if you saw this or not, Daniel, um, was there Elon reaffirmed the company's strong production volume going into the back half yeah. of the year, right? So as a quote, he said, and as a result, we have the potential for a record-breaking second half of the year. This reaffirms their 50% growth target for 2022, right? They're going to hit 1.4 million vehicles this year. So to me, I'm excited about Tesla. I'm, I'm for once in a while, you know, I, I, I'm the type of guy where I see a stock go up a bajillion percent. And I'm like, man, I'm just get out of here. I wait for it to come down. Or what's all the hype about? It's all hubba bubba, you know, and, but I'm, I'm excited. I think they're going to have a rock in second half. They're going to have a solid um, 2023. And to me, to your point, right, about the commodity prices and how it's impacting their margins, we look around and we see, yeah, commodity prices have, have made their, their fixed cost, cost of goods sold increase, but they're also increasing the prices of their vehicles. And that demand is sustained despite higher prices for their products. So I, I'm excited to see what they can do uh, for the second half of this year and, and uh, early next year. I mean, you're talking about a stock. I mean, of course, we're, we're about an hour out from uh, the Fed rate decision, which, of course, is going to probably move markets today. But I'm looking at Tesla stock right now, up 4% on the day. Definitely getting a nice uh, little bump since, you know, early July. We've seen this thing started to make a little bit of an upturn. I mean, the company just does everything. I mean, engineering is flawless. The production is flawless. Like, of course, they've gone through their bumps in the roads in the past, but what growth company hasn't, right? Mm -hmm. And you're seeing Shanghai reopen. You're seeing the supply chain start to pan itself out. It has a huge order demand book for the runway. And even if these cars start to come down in value, that's only going to increase the, the demand, right? If you can I, get I totally cars agree. down to the levels that Hondas and Toyotas are, are being bought for in America, I mean, that opens a whole new audience for this company. Um, Josh, why don't we go ahead and throw up that second uh, slide that I sent over to you about the growth grade. So I was looking through the quant system here, mm -hmm. and obviously this updates with the new metrics that come in every quarter. And I was looking at the growth grade in particular because I think you would agree with me. This is still a growth company. Like we mm -hmm. have not seen 
the growth slow down from Tesla with the new, the new factories opening in Texas and the ramp up in, in Giga Berlin. Um, I mean, the operating cash flow year over year, the growth 53.29%. I mean, some of the things that I was looking at, of course, CapEx growth. Yeah, you're going to, you're going to be spending money on CapEx. You're, you're sure. expanding your company internationally to solve issues you have, right? It used to be they spend probably the first two months of a quarter building cars over in California to put them on a cargo ship to get to mm -hmm. Europe. And mm -hmm. then they have the checks and if all the complications there of not being able to ship the cars with the headlights involved or in mm -hmm. them already. Like they ran into so many issues. So they're like, okay, let's fix this, right? We're going to spend the capital money and we're going to position ourselves to be able to be on their continent making these so that we can deliver faster. I mean, they are doing everything right. Hitting. I mean, what would you say the horsepower is thousand? 2000? Oh, I love mean, about 2000, but definitely it's up there, right? It's, it's, it's they are, to they that, are that completely thousand. crushing it as a management team. And even with Elon off doing, you know, his uh, SpaceX and Starlink and everything else, I mean, the company is crushing it. Um, so, yeah, I'm with you, man. This one really excites me. I'm not sure, you know, s s the share price is high, right? It's $800 a share. Obviously, we've mm -hmm. seen it higher. Um, but I think, you know, with the overall downturn in the economic cycle and looking to see how commodities come down, it might be shaky for a little bit longer, but I think we're eventually going to find a base in this stock and hopefully see a and, nice return. And to that point, Daniel, I'm excited to hopefully, you know, as we continue to see some uncertainty with their margins and the ramping of production and, and different types of perhaps it's deliveries, there's a little bit of uncertainty for sure around their business right now from a modeling perspective. And I think because of that, we'll, we'll see some continued volatility in their stock price. And I'm going to be treating this as a, an accumulation time, right? Well, I'm, I'm buying the dip. If it's moving down big in one day, some, you know, some, some bad news happens. Elon tweets too much and it moves down. I'm buying the dip. I'm excited for the company because in five years, six years, I mean, it's going to be, oh, let's talk about that for a moment, if you don't mind. Did you see the CEO of General Motors say a week ago that in 2025, that their EV sales, their EV you know, vehicles are going to outpace Tesla. And then, all right, that was a week ago. And then yesterday after their earnings came out, they had a statement that said their goal now is for 2030 to hit $90 billion in annualized EV revenue. And I'm thinking, okay, you're, you're going to do more than Tesla in 2025. And then you're saying now five years after that, you're going to hit $90 billion. That's your new goal. Tesla will do $90 billion just this year, right? They'll do $130 billion next year. And by 2030, I mean, dude. 400, 500 billion. Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what, she, what kind of coffee Mary, the CEO of General Motors is drinking, but who's do, who's one of these models over there, man? It's, it's, it's crazy. Well, let me, it's crazy. Well, dude, you got to think about it. It's more than just the, the actual vehicle sales. I don't know if you, you should have probably picked up on this as well. And I'm sure you did was they're talking about the charging network, right? It, it, think about how many gas stations there are. And think yeah. about how many names control them, right? If you control the charging stations, that's reoccurring revenue over the long run. If you own that network, which is still being built out, right? This is like the early days of the railroad. You had a few railroad players, they built out the railroads and they held on and milked it for all it's worth. I'm sure we'll see something similar. I'm not sure the models that the, uh, the CEO of GM is, uh, is running with her team, but that might be probably only a small part. I imagine vehicle sales will definitely get a help as well. Um, yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on it. I mean, we got five or six years, right? So anything can happen. Yeah, uh, but I want to move. I want to move on to. Uh, I, I was looking at the earnings reports of AT and T and Verizon last week, and AT and T took a big hit. Verizon also had a big hit, and I mean, this is pretty surprising to me. Thinking about how you know, usually you think of the telecom companies as just stable, steady eddies, right? They're generating so much cash, and it's how do those management companies then? allocate that cash. And there's really only three big carriers um, in the US. And so I was looking at Verizon, I was listening to their earnings report, looking at their slide deck. And this came across to me because it, it reminded me of what you were saying about JP Diamond or JP Morgan and their earnings report is that their capital expenditures are not going down, no matter what's going on in this economy. And you see it right here at the last line there on their slide, um, capital expenditures, they're going to be unchanged they're still going to be spending so much money on CapEx. And I was thinking about this and I was like, oh yeah, it makes total sense, right? Like they're building the future of 5G right now. They've been winning the auctions of the C-band spectrum. They have to implement all the new technology. They have to put it up around cities. They're working on Fios. They're working on all these things. And I was like, okay, kind of gives me a little bit of a feeling of a pass here for them. Josh, I wanted to go ahead and take over uh, the screen from you real quick. Um, and I want to bring up 
the where is my seeking alpha screen there it is i want to share this stuff that i was looking at across seeking alpha um so this is verizon of course i like to go to the growth grade because they're in that growing stage of the cycle that i was talking about and you're just seeing like revenue growth yeah year over year it's only up a little bit i mean they have so many uh subscribers already to their plan so it's kind of like in my mind verizon has been probably the biggest mobile carrier. And now you have T-Mobile, which merged with Sprint and you have AT&T. And so they're all competing over the same amount of people, right? Especially with our population declining. And that's a whole topic for another time. Um, they're talking about their points of, uh, shoot, what do they call it? The POPs, the points of whatever it is, IP addresses, mobile devices, internet, uh, still in my mind right now, but there's only so many. And that's why they're trying to grow those numbers through something like a merger with T-Mobile and Sprint. So I was looking at revenue growth year over year, very, very weak. Um, obviously operating cash flow growth is also very weak. CapEx spending. So I was like, all right, well, let's check out AT&T, right? Took a huge hit down to $18. I mean, this management company hasn't been my favorite either. They've tried all sorts of things. They were trying with the HBO. They wanted to do all sorts of mergers in the entertainment space. Um, I think they honestly forgot they were a telecom company for a little bit because they had such a great wave when the iPhone came out. I'm sure you remember that. Um, they were just like the big position to be in and they, they had dominant control because everybody wanted the iPhone. But once contracts ended and now here we are uh, 15 years later, they're seeing the repercussions and they had to cut their dividend during COVID, which, by the way, we'll get to in a second, because T-Mobile doesn't pay a dividend. And so I was like, hmm, it's pretty interesting. They don't have a dividend. They're not trying to protect it. They're merging with Sprint. They're investing all of their free cash flow back into the company. They're acquiring people left and right. They're still working on integrating Sprint into their, their base that they have now with their uh, infrastructure. They're getting rid of the old network slowly, quarter after quarter. They're lining up pretty fairly well for the, the days and weeks and months to come ahead. Um, let's see, Good where did I go with them, this? man. I'm over here. Quant ratings, a strong buy. I mean, look at this, dude. Like, do you remember T Mobile back in the day? I feel like no one it was a, a T Mobile. Yeah. T Mobile and Sprint were memes, man. We had the, the what was it, like the pink, you know, colors and the, the sidekick phone. I remember that. Sidekick, yes. Yeah. Stocks up twenty three percent year to date. I've slept on T Mobile, man. I haven't. They was they have not been on my radar at all this year. I really appreciate you bringing this up. This is really interesting to me. It's one to keep an eye on. I mean, the management also right now. I just want to point out it's ranked number one in the industry over here by the Quant Rating System, and I always take note on that because I just think you know, will they be the number one position in ten years, twenty years from now? I'm not sure. Just because, and this is what I want to bring up to you as well is the C-band auction, right? We talk about five band or 5G. Well, how does that work? It works off of the wave spectrums that travel through the air and, and ye who controls the waves controls the cash flow pretty much. It's the same thing that the broadcast TV industry had for the longest time. You had to license, uh, you had to buy a license in order for the rights to broadcast. It's the exact same thing that's going on with mobile carriers. There's only so much auction of bands that are out there. And so whoever owns those, if T-Mobile needs to tap into that, they're going to have to lease it from one of the competitors who have built out the infrastructure. And so I was going through, this is a blog, obviously, you see here, Light Reading with this guy, Mike Dono. And this was a while ago after the C-band auction that was came out. But Verizon, I want to point this out, Verizon right there, that huge red chunk. I mean, they, they paid handsomely for that. And they're going to be, it's going to take them a long time to end up having to pay this off. They'll do it over time, as long as they can retain market share. Um, but they own the majority of the C-band auction or, uh, uh, bands now. Um, so all these other companies are going to have to come to them if they need to expand because we can't just create new millimeter waves. Um, here's just another chart, but what I wanted to come down further here. So you start to see how much they're spending, the clearing costs, which they have to pay just to have it. Verizon obviously spent like $53 billion on this. AT&T is $27 billion. They're going to be struggling for a little bit as well as they in integrate all these. T-Mobile didn't really spend a lot. They had some from early on and the merging with Sprint and everything, but I kind of wonder if over the years coming down the road, if T-Mobile is great for investors now is kind of like a trade because they don't pay a dividend. They have more money that they can continue just to push into their business growth. But I think eventually they might hit a brick wall, which is something that I would caution everybody to keep an eye on 
if they want to dive into this further. I mean, Verizon, obviously you see the map is insane here. AT&T, the map is insane here. This is the coverage that they have. And you'll see in these little key boxes here, the different frequencies that they operate over. And then here's T-Mobile, right? That is a drastic difference. They have Florida, they have California. They went up to the Northeast. They're spread out over suburban and rural areas here and there. I think the merger with Sprint is probably the best thing that's ever happened to them to try to get them back on the map. Um, and of course this goes into wavelengths. You can check that out later. Um, and I was like, all oh, this is like, I'm, I'm processing this. I'm thinking about, okay, well, which one would be an investment today? Is any of them even investable right now? I'm thinking T-Mobile, but I wanted to compare their, compare their uh, balance sheets and everything side by side. So I went ahead into Seeking Alpha here to our peers tab where you can compare them side by side and put them right up against each other. And the first thing that really like struck out to me was, I mean, these are just drastically different size of companies. When you look at Verizon and T-Mobile and T-Mobile or T, uh, AT&T and T-Mobile, I mean, first off, market cap, okay, it looks pretty similar. Enterprise value, Verizon's got them beat, probably because they have more debt from the C-band auction. Employees, I mean, you're talking about 120 to 170,000 to only 75,000 for T-Mobile. So obviously lower labor costs there. We wow. start going down, quant rating right, strong buy. We continue to go down. Valuation of T-Mobile is apparently a little high, which I was like, hmm, maybe, okay. That's why I looked at the growth grades. Oh, growth is an A minus. Profitability, A plus. They're just cash flow machines. The stock's been in a momentum up run. EPS revisions are to the upside because they don't pay a dividend. That's where my mind kept coming back. Like, like it just makes sense to me, right? I think this yeah. might be a, a great trade in the in the in the near future. Oh, here you go, right here. Dividends. As you can see, Verizon has been paying their dividend for 18 years. Of course, they don't want to get rid of that. They're probably on their way to try to become a dividend king. Right. AT&T yeah, no gave way. up when they, you know, management hit the hit the road. Um, but so, anyways, I want to encourage everybody. If I mean, this is such an interesting industry to me, just because it's not going anywhere. It like it really isn't. It's it's here for the long run. As we move into 5G, as we move into AR headsets, as we move into Internet of Things and automobiles, um, you know, self-driving cars, all of this is going to require that infrastructure that these companies are building out. And I'm like, if you can pick the right one now, 10 years from now, you should have great returns. So anyways, I just wanted to bring that to attention, spark a conversation. Also, I was wondering, do you have any thoughts or did anything stand out to you specifically about that, those three companies? Well, you know, to your point about this, like no dividend, no dividend. I mean, it's, well, first off, I had no idea T-Mobile was this big. I still was kind of like thinking, you know, I saw their ads on Twitter. My friends that used T-Mobile back in high school, I was like, you guys suck. Like this, you know, T-Mobile is like, what are you doing? But now I'm seeing T-Mobile and I'm like, wow, $170 billion company. I mean, I scroll down here on Seeking Alpha and I'm, and I'm, and I'm seeing they'll do $81 billion in revenue this year. That's crazy. And to think that they can do that kind of revenue, who knows what the margins are? I'm not going to dive in too deep. But to your point of not having to pay out that dividend, right? That's probably billions and billions of dollars that they can now take to either, like you said, reinvest into maybe the C-band area to figure out you know, what, what their future looks like. And then the big kicker, in my opinion, which is interesting as to why Google always reports this figure is the employees, right? 70 something thousand compared to 120 or 150,000 employees elsewhere. That is an insane amount of money saved. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious and excited to see what T-Mobile is going to turn into in the coming quarters for sure. I really appreciate you bringing this to our attention and uh, I'm excited. Absolutely. Yeah. Not to mention, I mean, uh, I'm just looking it up right now. Uh, price of sales, 2.08 historically. I mean, it's like right in line. EBITDA, um, where are we? Oh, wait, PE non-gap is 28.10. So it looks a little overvalued, but it's like what growth company isn't, right? It's the same thing we say about Tesla and some other companies. Right. So I just want to put that on everybody's radar and I want to revisit it later on. Um, because I think it might have uh, it might have a little potential for for room to run in the in the meantime as they continue to take market share. But, I mean, uh, and what's see. interesting about it too is it's already up twenty two percent year to date. Are you kidding me? That's a you know forty percent delta on what the market has done. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, we could go into we could talk about this all day. I feel like, but I want to I want to keep this show moving a little bit. Um, let's talk about some top items of the week. What do you got for us? 
Yeah, let's do it. Um, so I, I guess to me, the, the thing that really grabbed my attention this week is cloud revenue, right? We saw Google report their earnings. We saw Microsoft report their earnings. And despite a lot of it being like, oh, okay, PC gaming or searches like normal advertising, we had a lot of like humble bubble over here left and right about what earnings would look like now that advertisers came out with Snapchat. We saw that Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure crushed it. And that to me just made my jaw drop. So let's talk about Google Cloud. Revenue came in at $6.3 billion, an increase of 36% year over year. You now compare that to their search growth of only 14%, YouTube ad revenue growth, only 5%, understandably advertisers on, you know, spending as much right now, obviously with what's going on with the macroeconomics uh, you know, of our economy. Uh, and then Google network revenue was only up 9%. So now you're thinking to yourself, all right, they're growing 36%, but what does that really mean if they're not making money on it? And I think what was cool is they addressed this in their earnings call. They got some pressure from folks saying, hey, why are you, you know, really spending time, energy, momentum, and, and just all these different types of resources trying to build out this, this unprofitable business segment? And, and today they said, listen, guys, like this is a long game. The switch into enterprise cloud is a long game. And they're doing that, that Google, I'm sorry, the, the Amazon game plan of, of kind of getting those people to become customers, don't make money for a long time, and then finally flip that switch. And then now you have these sticky customers that aren't going to go anywhere. They're enterprises, so they're certainly, they can certainly afford it, right? And, and now you're really monetizing uh, on these customers. So Google, I think, is it's just really cool what they're doing with uh, Google Cloud. The next one now is Microsoft, right? So Microsoft Azure, get this, man, 46% increase year over year in cloud Azure revenue. That is crazy. 46%, man. That's just bonkers to me. Um, Biggest takeaway from my perspective is you're not just like, you kind of think about this for a moment. It's like, okay, if Google's doing 36% and Microsoft's doing 46%, that's not just organic growth. That's market share, right? Mm-hmm. Microsoft is taking my market share. If it's from Google, it's from Amazon, whoever, but at 46% growth, like Microsoft is doing something right where they're taking market share from other competitors. And that's really powerful. Um, and it's also worth noting that Microsoft credits a lot of this growth um, to their consumption-based arrangements with these enterprises. So it's like, you know, you pay for what you use. I think Snowflake is, is really popular for doing that as well uh, with, with their products. But to me, this was the big, you know, just blaring green flag in my eyes is all this such cool revenue growth in these, in these cloud-based business models with uh, Google and Microsoft this week. Really excited to see what happens with Amazon. Dude, just piggybacking off of that, because I don't know if you saw this news today that came out uh, this morning, I believe it was, Microsoft turning to Google and Oracle. Did mm, you see this? No. Part, they, so what? pretty much what they want to do to back off exactly what you were just talking about is everybody realizes Amazon has cloud dominance, right? They, they were the pioneers and, and took the market share in the get-go and became sticky because it's so hard to get off of the cloud. And so it says, Microsoft has asked other cloud computing companies, including Google and Oracle, to help to speak to the U.S. government and spread its contracts so as to curb Amazon's dominance in the space. That's per the Wall Street Journal. Just came out this morning. Exactly lines up with exactly wow. what you were just talking about. So truly solid points. But I agree with you, man. The growth in the cloud is insane. I don't think we've seen anything yet either. I don't think so either. We're in the we're in like the national anthem right now of a baseball game, in my opinion. Like it's not the, the first, you know, bat has not even swung yet with, with enterprise adoption of, of cloud. I'm, I'm really excited for that for sure. Not to mention the margins on cloud are just incredibly insane, right? If you know how servers and that infrastructure work is you buy those those data processing chips, you have the hard drive space, you have the interconnectivity. And sure, when something breaks, it's backed up on a RAID system or something else. Like there's, there's fail safes and it just makes sense. And the thing that I love that I haven't looked into, maybe you have, is I think about Apple, right? And how well they do with packaging their cloud system into their mobile devices, and if you're an Apple customer and you're using cloud for files or for photos, think about photos, right? No one wants to lose photos. And as those are being uploaded to the cloud, that's just another part of those sticky product business uh, plans that just works. And it keeps people into that cycle. And it's like, oh, well, it's only $3. It's only $8 a month. Exactly. And man, that is so sticky. And that's how you get those customers for life. I'm here for it, man. I totally agree. And, and like, you know, while we're talking about Apple, let's do some uh, speculation. Um, you know, Apple and Amazon are, are still yet to report. Um, and so I think what's going to be interesting with Apple specifically is uh, Tim Cook's remarks on the macro economy and uh, what, what he's seeing, right? I think their product roadmap is, is really cool. 
um, going forward. I think we're going to see a lot about that. But uh, despite any buzz and, and, and hubbub with that, I, I think people are really going to begin to look to, to Tim Cook in this earnings call as sort of the guide for what the more high earner in America, the higher spender is going to be thinking about. I mean, if he's saying that maybe not seeing as much momentum with products or perhaps with services, like that's going to be really, really big. I know we sidestepped a couple of these questions uh, last quarter. And so it, that's, that's what's really going to catch my eye uh, this, this quarter. Do you, do you think that they're going to take the, I mean, look, the market has presented them an opportunity right now to weaken their earnings guidance and everything else, right? They've given them the perfect opportunity with how Microsoft and Google and all these other companies are coming out saying, well, the weak environment, the slow, weak environment. But I think, yeah, sure, we're going to look at iPhone numbers. But we've also seen reports of the quarter about iPhone is doing great in China. It's taking mm-hmm. market share. Mm-hmm. The iPhone 13 was a massive hit over there. Finally, right? <laughs> With a country that's been dominated by Android phones for so long, Apple is finally starting to claw way more at that market, which is a huge growth opportunity, especially since they're coming out of their lockdowns. And, and China is still kind of in this QE phase, right? So they're still, you know, interest rates are low. They're not really hiking like we mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. and everybody else in the world. So there's this opportunity for the consumers over there to continue to spend. And I mean, that's a massive, massive market that Apple can integrate into probably a certain degree before their government starts freaking out over it. Um, But they also employ so many people over there. They bring so much money to Foxconn and all the other factories. I mean, it it seems like it's so well set up for an easy beat. But I think once you go into the service numbers like you're talking about, how is gaming doing? How is Apple fitness? How are the wearables? What are we looking at with Apple Watch and AirPods? Because eventually... Once you get Apple AirPods, unless they break, you're not buying another pair, right? So they're sticky, right. well-made hardware, which is something that's like, okay, well, once we hit that level in the market, that's why they need to innovate new products and really push the service side. So I'm kind of looking at some of those little service numbers myself, because I think, you know, Macs and the iPhones were expecting probably a little bit of a beat, even though there's a slowdown in the PC market. Um but really when it comes down to wearables, because we also know that, you know, there's whispers of the AR headset coming out right, within the next right. year or two. So is that the next evolution of wearables? I'm not positive. I mean, I'm going to roll the dice, Daniel, and I'm going to say that they will use this opportunity to either cut their guidance or, or really just like, you know, set the tone. Um, I just, I just don't know that if they're going to be able to reaffirm or even just, keep rocking on the same momentum that they thought they would have had, you know, seven or 10 months ago going into the year, but you know, we'll see. Right. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. And, and I hope Apple, I mean, I'm a shareholder, right? I hope I'm wrong, uh, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I think uh, everybody that owns Apple, which is pretty much the entire market is on the <laughs> same boat. So um, let's keep the show moving. We'll get back to the, the earnings coming up here in a little bit after let's look at some chart talk. What did you bring for us this week? So I recently drove, I think it was like 12 hours from Tampa to Nashville. And I spent some time trying to think about what do I want to listen to? And so I'm the type of guy that's going to download those like two hour long YouTube videos so I can have something to listen to when I'm driving. And one of those videos I listened to was Dave Ramsey's real estate reality check. And I don't agree with half the stuff that this guy talks about, likely including some of the points he was making here, but I thought it'd be interesting to bring these charts uh, to you to get your perspective and perhaps even the audience, right? So the two charts uh, I want to bring are the existing home sales chart, which shows that existing home sales has declined dramatically since the turn of the year. However, despite that dramatic decline, if you flip now over to the median home sales price chart, we see that median home sales prices are going through the roof now, coming in close to $420,000. So, and now this is interesting because if you think about nominal and, 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 and real returns, things of that nature as, as, as it relates to inflation, like what do these numbers really mean? Like we can think about this from all the different angles, but I think it's, it's incredibly important to consider just how insane this is considering the Price hikes we've seen. I'm sorry, the interest rate interest rate hike we've hikes we've seen from from the Fed. I I just bought a investment property myself uh, quite recently. I've had a really 
cool opportunity come along. And I'm paying 6.6% interest on that mortgage. I, when I bought my house here in Nashville four years ago, I, I would think it was 3.2%. So, I mean, it's, it's just crazy to see how many people are going to be priced out of the markets while these interest rates rise. But for whatever reason, despite lower volume, lower sales volume, we're still going to see higher prices. We have seen higher prices historically. I, it's hard to say what's going to happen in the future. Dave Ramsey, to that point, when I was listening to his, uh, his, his webinar, which has got me thinking about this now and sharing it with you, Daniel, he thinks that there's not going to be a housing crash. He thinks we're going to see you know 7 or 8% this year, another 4 or 5% increase next year. And who knows, obviously, in 2024 and 2025. But I just think this is so interesting to think about considering what we've seen the Fed do, what we'll see the Fed do today, um, it just just every every just everything, man. This is this is wild. It sounds like he's in the boat of a soft landing, right? <laughs> I mean, hey, Josh, can you throw up that uh, that first chart that he brought again, the volume chart of? And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You said this is the volume of houses for sale, right? Correct. Now? This is existing home sales. Okay, yeah. so we got five thousand one hundred twenty that, that, that are not newly built, and they're just you know th this is the volume on the uh, in, in the housing market for sure. Pe peak of January twenty twenty two, which completely makes sense. And now go to the the next chart, and this is the average price, which is mm -hmm. crazy. The correlation, which the inverse correlation, right? January. <laughs> I know. I wish I could. I should have photoshopped them on top of each other, right? It's 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 crazy. So this is interesting though, because, you know, I was, I was on a, uh, doing a webinar with Eric Bazmachin from EPV macro research yesterday. And we were talking actually about real estate. He was talking about economic cycles and the uptrends and the downtrends and, and what sectors do well and what, and what times of the cycle. And, uh, he was talking about how the volume leads price, but now I'm looking at this chart and I see a decrease in volume, but increase in price. And I can't help but wonder why. Right. So, yeah. okay. Chart off, Josh. Thanks. Um, I don't know. Did you see this report the other day that got recirculated again about the amount of real estate being bought by Chinese investors in America? Have you seen that? I don't know if it was that report. I did see a report where people were saying how, you know, one in four of all homes, one in three homes in, in Atlanta were sold to investors, one in four homes in, in like the top 15 by volume cities in the United States were sold to investors. I don't know if that's foreign or domestic, I would imagine to your point now, it's a lot of it that could be foreign investors from China. Yeah. So this was seven days ago. I'm just going to take over again real quick, Josh, and, and pull this up for everybody. Um, let's see, where is it? There it is. So seven days ago, put out by New York Post, uh, Chinese spent $6.1 billion on US real estate last year. Mm. Um, I, I can't imagine, look, I used to live in LA and it was a very well, it wasn't even a secret. It was just very well known that if you weren't Persian, if you weren't Jewish, then if you owned real estate, it was probably a large chunk of the Chinese investors parking their cash in America, um, mm. which could be a problem, right? It's obviously a problem. We have a lot of <laughs> yeah. people that need a place to live here, um, but that's, that's where they're parking their cash now because A, US dollar is so high. Our economy is stable. They're not seeing the the real estate bust of mm -hmm. bad mortgages like it was back in 07, 08. Um, the no income loans really aren't there. Uh, obviously, loans are very different now. I keep hearing mm -hmm. all this other whispering. I was talking to a, a guy that works in financial investing for mortgage-backed securities and stuff last weekend. He was saying to me that it's, it's a reoccurring thing that's happening. And again, the same, they're just calling them different right now, the the CDOs and everything. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I believe that entirely. Um, so I also asked him, I was like, Oh, well, what, what were you being told at the beginning of the year? And he's like, Oh, we knew, we knew volatility was coming. I was like, okay, well, what are you being told now? And he's like, we're being told a hundred basis point hike from the fed today. And I was like, wow. Oh, all right. Well, I'm not going to count it out. Yeah. There's definitely still a lot of inflation in the system. And it's going to take a while to come down, but 75 basis point and let it ride out as they go to Jackson hole and come back in September and reevaluate. They're a very data dependent Fed. Mm -hmm. So I get what you're saying, man. I know that there's an undersupply of homes and apartments and townhomes, and, and we need more infrastructure here in America for people to have houses and bring those prices down. But what you just showed me with these charts, I'm so glad you brought them because I'm literally seeing the volume come down and the price increase because the demand is still there. Yeah. We have yeah. this. I mean, crazy I mean, me, demand. right? I, I just bought an investment property because the numbers made sense. It's even at 6.6%, right? I don't know, man. It's it's going to be really interesting. And I think a, a point too that I didn't bring up here that Dave talked about was if you think about the prime 
home buyer is someone in their mid thirties, right? And so back in 2008, it's all this, you know, he's comparing this between now to 2008. Everyone says we have another 2008 cooking, big crash coming. Um, back in 2008, we had about 55 million people in America that were in this like age cohort to be like a good prime home buyer. Now we have north of 67 million people. So the you know, higher demand met with lower new housing starts, met with lower inventory. I mean, it's just, it, it's a recipe for higher prices. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's just an interesting thing to keep, a, uh, keep an eye on for sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm long-term bullish. I mean, you can go look at some REITs if you want to get that exposure to your portfolio without owning property, uh, like you're doing. Um, so I want to, I want to keep moving here since we're, uh, we're coming up on two o'clock hour and everybody's going to go watch the fed. Let's be honest. Everybody's waiting for that. Everybody's waiting for that. I'm there too. <laughs> everybody's waiting for that press release. So, Hey Josh, go ahead and throw up this first chart I brought. Um, and this actually came from your rate of return. Substack. So mm -hmm. shout out to mm -hmm. you. Thanks for throwing this out to everybody. This one struck struck me really, really hard because I was looking at it and I was looking, uh, I'll just read it real quick. Losing confidence along a similar vein to the metric above, the Consumer Confidence Index CCI provides an indication of future developments of households, consumption, and saving, sentiment on the general economy, unemployment, and capability of savings. The U.S. usually prides itself on being ahead of the world average but we've been well below it since early 2021. And then I was like, holy cow, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, um, go ahead and take the chart off, Josh, appreciate it. So I was thinking about it, like, this is just sentiment though, isn't it? Like we're talking about the sentiment of how mm -hmm. people feel like they want mm -hmm. to spend. And I think we all kind of know there's this correlation between not only watching your, your savings in your bank account go down, your credit increasing and your 401ks, IRAs being hit and all that, but can't this, I mean, if it's sentiment, it can change overnight, right? Yeah, yeah, I would imagine. Um, I'm wondering if uh, if this is just a natural, almost like a cycle itself, because actually let's throw the chart back up real uh, quick again, Josh. Because if you looked at the far left side of the chart, um, what was this, 2014, I think it says? Yeah, 2014. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, the red line's below, which were the red line. So that was probably the end of what we were feeling from 07, 08, great financial crisis, right? That was our steady climb back to yeah, the top. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Hit with this bull run. Obviously, during this bull run, we've had consumers always feel great. They want to spend. They want to get out. They want to buy clothes. They want to go travel. They want to hit the services. They want to do everything. They want to buy new consumer discretionary goods. Um so it's kind of like, is this the ultimate leading indicator? It's kind of what goes through my <laughs> mind. Obviously, it pops early, right? We're looking at 2021. You would be sitting, missing probably out on returns that entire rest of the year. Um, but then you look at where we're at now, and you probably pretty much would be flat at this point if you were just in an index fund of the overall market. Isn't that pretty wild? That is wild. And it's kind of interesting to see, like, I mean, if you compare that to obviously when a lot of these growth stocks had popped in early 2021 as well, I think it was like, Feb you know, mid, mid early February, which seems like kind of where that black line is, is trending toward. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing to, uh, to consider. And I think what just blows my mind away, and I think it has to do with the subject, but, you know, we saw the White House completely redefine traditional ideas of what a recession looks like. And I think, some of that, I mean, just, just seeing the flip-flop we've seen from if it's political, if it's inflation, if it's the Fed not having confidence enough to, you know, I guess our you know, consumers not having confidence in, enough in the Fed to boost interest rates when they, should, when they should or pull it back. Like, there's just so much stuff right now where people are kind of like in this limbo, in my opinion, including myself, right? I don't really have much confidence in what the hell's going on. And I think I'm not in the minority by any means. No, I think everybody's exactly in the same page as you. I mean, we're all, we all think that the feds lost credibility, right? They, they made themselves data dependent, said everything was about job, nothing job uh, numbers and nothing else mattered. Hindsight, 2020, <laughs> you know, um, hindsight is 2020 funny. Um, you know, we're going to look back and we're going to study this period for the decades to come. And it's going to become one of those moments where we go, Oh, okay. Maybe if unemployment stopped at 4.5 instead of 3.6, we would have averted all of this because mm -hmm. we don't know what we don't know. We didn't know Russia was going to invade Ukraine. We didn't know that there's going to be this continuing lockdown in China over and over and over again, which also is kind of happening again. Um, you're not going to, you're seeing all the debt issues going on with Europe because of the war. You're seeing Sri Lanka government being toppled and everything happening over there that doesn't get talked about. 
I mean, there's so many things that we don't know that are happening all the time. So we should have factored in some sort of degree of contingency, which it really doesn't feel like we did. And now we're getting, you know, feeling the effects of it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, I think today is going to be a really big, it's going to be, I mean, the Fed needs to do, they, they need to re just, just show their authority and com- and just really regain that confidence again. And um, I don't know, we'll see. It's just, it's one of those things where you kind of look back at it and you, it's obviously, you know, hindsight's 2020 and you, you know, just to that point though, it's just, you look back and you think, how could we have been like, this was so obvious. Like, how could we have been so silly? I don't know. Mm, yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and throw up this, uh, this last chart that I, uh, that we kind of made internally, Josh, go ahead and throw that up on the screen. This is what, uh, Ooh. we're not done. You know, isn't it exciting? This is like the greatest week of the quarter, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah some I, of the largest it, names announcing the earnings. S&P 500's market cap reports this week, right? 50%. That's huge. Yeah. So these are the ones that I'm specifically really looking forward to. Obviously, Qualcomm, the chip maker, chips have been hit or miss this earnings quarter. I think Qualcomm's got, you know, they're innovative. They lead the charge in 5G. That one's really exciting. I want to see what they have to say. They're also going into automotive and moving away from mobile phones, um, which I think is really interesting to watch. I wanted to ask you, though, what's your take on Meta? What are you expecting out of this one? Honestly, I'm not at all optimistic. Um, I think that Meta is, I don't know if you've seen what they've done with Instagram lately, but I have seen it's so horrible. many stuff on, yeah, it's, it's, it's disgusting. I, I can't even use the app anymore. Um, I've just seen so many people share such harsh, bad feedback. And it was funny. I was with my girlfriend last weekend and I was like, I'm surprised you haven't put like an Instagram story up yet. You know, we're out with all our friends and she's like, well, yeah, but I hate using this app now. So I just don't, don't do it anymore. And I just, I don't know, but I, I would, I would think that meta is they're going to have to figure it out, man. They're, they're going to see a lot of people, a lot of if it's daily or monthly active users around the world begin to move off their platforms, which obviously is going to eat into their margins, considering that not just considering that the ad, you know, revenue and ad, ad money is, is going to be slowing down as we saw with Snapchat, but it's just, it's one thing to have that slow down and still, and still have a really good product. It's another thing to have it slow down and have people move off your product as well. It's like a double whammy, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting you bring up Snapchat because I was thinking it back to, um, you know, I think Meta is pretty lucky right now that they're over 50% off of their highs because do you remember when uh, the Kardashian girl came out where maybe it was Kylie Jenner or whoever it was and was like, Snapchat, I can't use it anymore. And their market cap tanked by like over $1 billion just from her saying that. I don't know. When was that? They, Oh man, that was like a year or two ago, I feel like. And now the Kardashians came out about this Instagram change and they're like, we can't even use this app anymore. And I'm like, ooh, but Facebook share or Meta's share price hasn't really budged on it. I'm like, well, because it's probably, it's already 50% down. I think the thing that I want to continue to watch is, you know, you brought this up the other uh, week in our conversation is who's going to profit off of the metaverse play that they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I was doing some more research, you know, Meta at one time, they're, they're trying to build out the ecosystem, right? They really want to uh, build out the place that all the other hardware technology companies have to come to in order to tap in. And when they were building their Quest 2 or their original Quest headset, they also had a team at one point trying to develop their own operating system for it. And they ended up shutting down that team to revert to Android, mm. you know, bullish Google. Um, and then obviously you have Zuckerberg coming out in an all hands meeting that he had or a town hall meeting saying that it's pretty much the competition for the metaverse is them versus Apple. Right. And they have two different philosophies where Facebook's all is all about community and wearing the headset over your eyes and not seeing the real world and getting plugged in and losing yourself where Apple's really standing on this block of let's do AR glasses and tap into our metaverse in that sense is, you know, whatever mm-hmm. they end up calling it, the X verse or whatever it is, um, where it's more augmented reality and you can still have conversations face to face, but still see your surroundings and just see digital overlays, mm-hmm. if you will, mm-hmm. which is personally, that's more appealing to me. I was going to um, agree. I was going to agree. Okay. I was going to ask you, what do you thought on that? So I think that's the where, that's where I'm kind of worried about, you know, meta pumping so much money into this. Now, if it's a video mm-hmm. game play only great, let them have at it. But also the people that won in the video game world and my entire thought and mind and everything else is the people that created uh Fortnite. Yeah. Right. 
you yeah. broke down the barriers of having to buy one specific operating console in order to play a game with your friends. Mm -hmm. You opened it to the entire ecosystem. And now Metaverse is trying to kind of clamp that back down. I just don't see it working. I don't see it happening. I would be very surprised if in call it five to seven years, it is the norm to wear these big goggles and like try. I just, I just don't see that happening. I don't think we're going to have like, you know, any of those types of gloves or a shirt or a jacket we wear to feel things differently. Like I think Apple's approach is the AR approach and that approach is the right way to go. Right. We saw this early adoption with Snapchat. I don't know about you, but there was a dancing hot dog on Snapchat when I was in college and it was awesome. Right. And so it's like, if Apple's going to introduce dancing hot dogs, like I'm, I'm here for it. Put me in, put me in. Right. Bullish hot dogs. iOS 14. Right. It's, it's really cool. And I think we've started to see that with Apple now with iOS 14. I don't know if you've seen, but you can like take a photo of your dog and you hold down on it. And iOS 14 detects the dog in the picture and you can take it out of the photo and put it in other places, right? I think that would be a really interesting first step toward what augmented reality might begin to look like with Apple and, and all these different types of you know, devices that, that they're uh, obviously selling. Yeah, they have the easiest way to integrate. So speaking of which, obviously Ford, I'm watching earnings after the close Thursday. We have Apple, Amazon, and Roku. Uh, Amazon worries me a little bit. Um, I think Roku is pretty much dead unless they figure out their ad play as well. And then yeah. on Friday, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, P and G, P and G. That obviously another consumer play, right? How well can you push the uh, inflation on your consumers? Mm -hmm. Chevron and Exxon, um, you know, oil and refining. I mean, it's seems pretty important. You have any thoughts on these before we jump out of here? Um, no thoughts, I guess specifically. But what what are you thinking about specifically with Ford? What what are you? Uh, what's going to be catching your your eyes or your ears on that one? Well, first off, we want to see if uh, our four CEOs drinking the same coffee as GM. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> see what they're saying about the EV space. I mean, look, Ford is the dominant uh, company when it comes to pickup trucks, right? Pickup trucks are not mm -hmm. going away. The, the, the people that love pickup trucks are going to get a pickup truck. And when they go electric, I think it's going to be a game changer. You know, my, my brother used to have a pickup truck. Um, and the amount of money of gas you spend on that alone for the love of the truck, you, you, you get pretty dedicated, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially mm -hmm. if oil prices continue to come up. Um, obviously oil is coming down, which is something that we need to keep an eye on. But I think as you're seeing this rotation into EV vehicles, I think Ford is very well positioned. Um, they have probably the best CEO that they've ever had in a long, long time. The guy is completely nutso about cars and actually understands automobiles and actually understands his audience, which is a great improvement over what they had in the past. Um, I think, you know, what's the share price is like, what, $11 right now? What's the market cap? What are we looking at? Cause I mean, this one's been pumped up and down a little bit over the, over the, the last two years, just cause of, um, I don't know. Wasn't Kramer pumping this one at one time? Oh, I feel like man, I feel like everything that guy pumps is just insane. Actually to a completely different tangent here, but kind of with Ford, have you heard about what's going on with John Deere? Mm, about agriculture or, or what are you referring to? So apparently, and, and again, this is me like inside of FinTalk, um, but I saw a video where this guy was sharing how with John Deere tractors, you have to like hack into the computer system to repair the, the, the tractor that you purchased um, if you can't afford or don't want the manufacturer of John Deere to repair it, right? So it's kind of like that right to repair stuff that Apple was going Apple, through with these repair yeah. shops and their, and their iPhones. And so John Deere is doing the same thing. They say, hey, you want, like, we will repair your John Deere, but you're going to pay us an arm and a leg to repair it. So you can kind of double dip on these consumers. But I saw there was a recent bill that was proposed and it's really close to passing, I believe, that completely gets rid of that kind of rule. What, that makes it law where these folks can take these uh, John Deere tractors to independent, independent providers and, and, you know, independent repairs, uh, to, to have that, uh, take place. And so I have no idea what's going to happen to John Deere stock after that. I feel like a lot of that news is probably already priced in, but, um, I, I saw a video on it more recently and I just, I, I don't know if you had any perspective. I think the cool thing about John Deere and specific, I mean, you're talking about a company that is so ingrained in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, with the machinery, machinery that they're creating, but they're also using AI in it now. Like they're pushing for more automation ability. I mean, imagine the day where you have, uh, farmers are able to send out a tractor and have it just do everything in the field without them actually having to drive it or, mm -hmm. or watch over mm -hmm. it or whatever. And I'm sure some of that might already be happening in some ways. Um, 
I mean, holy cow. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at their net sales and revenue by major product lines for last year. I mean, production of agriculture is huge. Road buildings, like nothing construct compact constructions, like nothing turfs, nothing. I mean, they own the agriculture space. So I think you bring up an interesting point. I don't know. Like how much money were they actually making off of? Right. That's, that's the real question, people... right? That, that's what's going to determine if this is material or not. If you're, if you're making, I'd say 10, 15, 20% of total revenue off of repairs, then that's certainly material. But if it's like the two and a half percent, I mean, it's like the argument against, you know, selling these regulatory credits for Tesla, right? I think it was less than 2% of revenue this quarter. People, oh no, the regulatory credits, they're making the money that way. It's like, come on, man, let's be real. So if, if John Deere is making the money through repairs, that's material, then that's going to be an impact. But if not, to your point, then... I guess it's one of those, you know, shrug your shoulders and kind of move on thing. Yeah. I mean, it looks like they have a really, really safe dividend as well, depending on what kind of investor trader you are. I mean, this would be a long-term investor, but um, consecutive years of dividend payments, 32 years. Wow. Um, Not know that. Their latest dividend, $1.13. Uh, their dividend's looking safe, man. The cash dividend payout ratio, it's only 90%. It's a little high against the sector, but that's not horrible. Um, cash from operations 4.18 billion i haven't looked at their debt or anything but um maybe I, i'll look at this one a little bit further you know but payout ratio is only 21 percent, so they're barely hmm. tapping any of their cash to pay out the the dividend i mean that's amazing um Wait, then what, what was that 90 percent you mentioned the 90 percent was one second let me go back the 90 percent was the cash dividend payout ratio got it okay uh, for the trailing 12 months. So take that into consideration. But yeah, um, actually, I'm just going to scroll down real quick. I'm just looking at Seeking Alpha. I and mean, this is what I do for everything. You just go I here. I love it, man. It's, it's such a useful tool. Pages, the quanta buy on it for anyone that wants to check it out. I mean, uh, let's see here. Total cash, most recent quarter is $3.17 billion. Total debt, $49 billion. But is that assets? We got to look into that, what they're doing with all that. So, I mean, it's a very complicated company. But also, if you're bullish on agriculture, like Bill Gates is because he's, I was going to say like Bill America. Gates, man, he yeah. owns like half of, well, not half, but like a quarter million acres um, of agriculture on the United States. It's wild. Yeah. So we'll take an eye on that. Uh, hey, Josh, go ahead and throw up the last slide for me today. We're going to go ahead and get on out of here before the Fed decision here in just a few minutes. Uh, if you came from Michael Boyd, sorry, he wasn't able to join us today. We will get him on here again in the future soon. And if you want to reach out to us, reach out on LinkedIn, reach out, reach out on Twitter. You know, drop out, uh, say hi, tell us what you think about the show. Give us any comments. If you have any questions, let us know. If you want us to deep dive on an individual stock or something that you're reading in the market, let us know that as well. Uh, anything else from you, Austin? Actually, uh, to that Twitter point, I just shared a tweet thread, a Twitter thread, I don't know whatever people call it, on this Dave Ramsey, um, you know, real estate reality check that he had kind of showing those graphs. So if, if uh, any of these attendees are listening and they think, okay, that's interesting, let me learn more about that actual numbers, Twitter thread right there. It'll be, uh, it'll be the first tweet that you'll see. Sweet, man. Yeah. I'll have to go check it out here in a second. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and until next time, this has been stock market live, Josh, get us on out of here. Love it. See you guys.